yo, this is the Mint Configuration Horror Podcast. I am Greg Knox, and I am joined by the Debbie McGee to my Paul Daniels, our resident body count girl, reoffend. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Love the intro. Uh, it's good to be back, and I do indeed love horror as much as Sir Mixlot likes big butts, and I cannot lie. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> but, bit, of, um, bit of a zany start to a very serious show about rape revenge. <laughs> yes, because when you're doing a show about rape, obviously that's the kind of intro that you want to do, <laughs> but oh well. Um, so, on that <laughs> note... I, as, as I said last episode, can we call this Revenge of the Rape Revenge? Because this is part two. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so this is indeed the revenge of the rape revenge films. Um, so yes, as Ria has very delightfully put it, and very tastefully put it, I should also add. Um, yes, these are three more rape revenge video nasties. And so, for anyone who doesn't know, these are the seventy-two films that the DPP uh, said to violate the Obscene Publications Act, nineteen fifty-nine. And yes, the, these films are really very very tough they're very nasty so Ria why don't you take us away with the warning warning the following broadcast contains spoilers extreme language sexual violence and topics considered graphic or adult not for those of a sensitive disposition it may also include racism this episode well there's no may about it there will be racism discussed in this episode at some point so not yeah. from us i might add but no. definitely in one of the films we're about to discuss no but we will get to that when we get to the film that has that issue in it um so if we're going to talk about rape revenge films just to give you kind of a quick very brief history of rape revenge films so obviously we had last house on the left which we discussed on the last show and following that, it was very influential in Italy, as I said, but it was also very influential on the exploitation scene in America with films such as Death Weekend, which is actually pretty good, with a film called Miss 45, which I think is the best rape revenge film, um, which is directed by Abel Ferrara, the director of Driller Killer, um, and also a film called Thriller, which is also known as They Call Her One Eye, which was a massive influence on Quentin Tarantino when he made Kill Bill. Um, however, uh, no Michael Jackson in there, though. No, it's not that thriller. No, <laughs> it's a very different thriller. Um, however, um, the most well known rape revenge film, indeed, this is sort of the uh, Nate plus ultra of rape revenge films, is this one, which is I Spit on Your Grave, which is also known as Day of the Woman and I Hate Your Guts. Uh, now, Day of the Woman quite interesting because the director of this film Miyazaki um, he wanted to call his film Day of the Woman and I want to kind of talk about that when we kind of get into the review itself um, but to me that's a more appropriate title than I Spit on Your Grave although I Spit on Your Grave is a pretty fucking cool title as well I'm not gonna lie um, so yeah Ria um, have fun in discussing the synopsis on this one it's a 1978 film an aspiring female writer is repeatedly gang-raped, humiliated, and left for dead by four men who she systematically hunts down to seek revenge. Yeah, so the plot is very, very stripped down and bare of this film, I've got to say. So really, the plot is essentially, there's a woman, she gets attacked by four guys, um, they think that she's dead, she's not, she kills them. And that's the whole film, really. So, yeah, plot-wise, this has got a very, very stripped, bare plot, as I said. Yeah, and like you say, it is another classic. It's so renowned. Um, it's up there with Last House on the Left. Um, it's got to be one of the most controversial films in horror that a lot of people talk about, you know. Um, it's one of those films that when you, if you when you get into horror, people ask you, "Have you seen this film?" So, I've seen it several times before, but I've rewatched this, um, and I've also seen the remake as well. So, I can comment on that at the end if you wish to. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of one of those, like you said, it's kind of like a tolerance sort of horror film test. It's kind of like, "Oh, have you seen that one?" Basically, because. 
I'm not going to lie, this is a very tough film to watch. Of all the films that we're talking about on this show and the last show, this is probably the most difficult to watch, in my opinion. Yeah, it's quite graphic. There's more rape shown than what we discussed on the last episode in terms of them showing full body shots, full nudity. She's very bedraggled um, in between uh, sexual acts. Um, she gets to the point where she can barely talk and she's just full of bruises and mud and just completely start naked and she's just a, like a shell of a person. Like she's numb to the point where she's not really fighting back anymore, which is what's so distressing about this. Um, and the gang are particularly vicious and they all take turns and it, it's just, yeah, it's horrific. When you first see this film, it's, very very shocking yes now what i want to talk about before we kind of discuss the film in and of itself is as i said um so the director he wanted to call the film day of the woman and i believe he made the film um because of a story that kind of happened similar to the plot in this film it was a woman she was horrifically raped and kind of he wanted to make a film that in his words empowered women um, however, when it came out, it had very, very different reactions. Um, the one that's most commonly brought up is the reaction from the late American film critic Roger Ebert, who basically gave it a zero out of four review. And he, uh, yeah, let's just say he didn't like the film very much, let's put it that way. And he kind of saw it the complete opposite from maybe what was intended. Now, as a woman, which side of the queen do you fall on? Oh, it's this is very, very relevant. Like, I, I actually could not wait to discuss this because I've been on my sort of daily trip to Sainsbury's today and I've been uh, sexually harassed on the way, which is a normal thing where I live in the busy part of London where I live. And there's a similar argument for what these guys were saying in the street when they were catcalling me, is that it's down to what I chose to wear today. And this is mentioned in I Spit on Your Grave, that they're saying that she's provocative with the way she dresses, the way she moves, and that she's wearing a bikini near the beginning and things like this. And this is, today, this is such a current um, issue that a lot of women have been protesting um, by going sort of nude to protest with like key areas covered up and having written on them that they're not asking for it by what they're wearing because that's like the sort of topical phrase that goes with this. So I have completely mixed views on this film. I feel like this is a very valid thing to watch as a horror fan. Um, again, I feel like I'm, I learn things from watching films that are this gritty about human behavior and humanity because it is a window into seeing that sort of behavior without seeing it firsthand and I very much believe that escapism and getting a concept of something like that this is the best way to do it because it's not harmful um, you can it's not real and you can get away from that but you still see what might have happened and you consider yourself very lucky after watching this film with if you're living a normal life and you haven't encountered violence in that way. But I don't approve of the way that the revenge is um, brought about by her at the end. And it's the nature of which she does it. And for anybody who's seen the remake of this film, they do it in a different way. There are two very big differences between that. Um, it's the way that... So in the remake... She gets her revenge by killing them in, in brutal, gory ways and, and um, making them suffer. In this one, the part that I don't like is that she lures them um, sexually and she performs sexual acts before she kills them, which is something that I mentioned in the last episode as well. I feel that that is a sacrifice that she shouldn't have to make and it's a step too far and it's almost degrading the woman in that the revenge that she gets to perform on them and eventually kill them should not be at the cost of her own body. She shouldn't be using sex in order to do that and I don't believe she has to. She could imply that she might perform a sexual act 
and then kill them, but should she really have to go ahead with having sex with them or performing oral sex or anything that happens in, in this film? No. She's been through enough already. Does she really need to do that in order for it to be convincing? I feel that that is taking it too far and that it's degrading herself. That is not a smart thing to do and it's it's horrible and disgusting in my mind. Yeah, I mean, I I have seen the remake and I did want to discuss it, you know, at the end of, of this review. Um, so I'm going to take everything that you've said sort of on board and sort of, you know, try and keep it in mind for when for later on um however i get everything that you say in terms of the revenge but the protracted long series of rapes do you feel they are exploitative or you know how do you feel about them as a whole um yeah terribly exploitative okay in what way um just the way I'm just trying to remember specifics here. Um, it's very drawn out. Like I say, there are full body shots, so there's quite a lot of simulation of sex where she's like, for example, she's put across a rock and held down, and then they obviously they're not really doing that, but the actor is, you know, simulating having sex with her and it's just all, it, it's very much like um, in Cannibal Holocaust and things like that that we've discussed before, where it's very much a game to them. Like, they're having a lot of fun, there's a lot of kind of jovial remarks, there's a lot of egging each other on to do things. Um, there's the guy who's, again, mentally challenged, so you've got that balance in the group that you discussed on the last episode where they have the kind of reluctant one that's a bit more of a sort of um, nice person towards her, and they sort of mock him and say he's going to die a virgin, and they... Um, in, they sort of um, force him into doing things by tormenting him. Um, it's very rough and very violent. Like the way that the men rape her, they are very aggressive about it, which makes it so much more uncomfortable. They really sort of smack her about. They are very heavy handed with everything. Um, they're sort of forcing themselves very, like I say, very vig vigorously and making sort of loud grunting noises or something like that. And it just comes across as very animalistic, very, um, like I say, violent and very rough. And she suffers a lot for it. And her appearance throughout this just diminishes and you can see that she just is worn down she's filthy dirty she is confused and dazed and numb and she doesn't know where she is and she's just kind of wandering around and it's just horrific so it really is just the kind of the repetitiveness of it the fact that they're having fun um, taking turns with it and very 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 degrading just like they just don't even treat her like a human being they just throw her around like a rag doll really yeah yeah um totally agree with everything that you said um i suppose this is going to sound like i don't know if this is a stupid question or not which because i know you've seen the film because we've talked about this before which did you find harder to watch this or irreversible Oh, it's been a long time since I've seen Irreversible, so I can't quite remember. I'd have to rewatch that because it's been many, many years. Um, I'm not sure, actually. I can't comment on that. It wouldn't be fair. Okay, I mean, I... What about, what about you? Yeah, I, I kind of found this harder to watch because, well... It, I don't want to make it seem like a game uh, is in like well like a point scoring exercise so all I'll say is that I found this very hard to watch in terms of one how long the whole kind of ordeal lasts so irreversible mm. it's one long 10 minute uncut scene but then that's it whereas yeah. this you've got one rape 
and then there's a bit of a lull and then there's another rape which is even worse which is you know the anal rape which is quite hard to watch and listen to that I did not have a lot of fun watching I'm not gonna lie and then the, when she gets back to her cabin there's the uh, various stuff that happens in the cabin which is still hard and there's a pretty big jump scare actually at the start of that whole section which made me jump um, but yeah it's um, yeah it's not very pleasant but then again it's not supposed to be pleasant because rape isn't pleasant it's horrific so could you maybe see the argument in that this is a as true to life depiction of rape as you could get as opposed to i can't think of any films off the top of my head but there have been sort of films made after this that depicted rape and it's kind of just tossed aside as it's like oh it's just a thing that happened and it's fine you know whereas this is it is really horrific and it's just yeah. as i said so hard to watch it's a film that's centred all around the rape and it is continuous and repetitive, like I say, they're taking turns and I, I would argue as much to say that you'll probably never watch another film like this. Like, I think it's, I mean, obviously there are other films with lots of raping because we're covering a lot of them in these these two episodes, this one and the last one. Um, but I feel that this is different. It is the most uncomfortable. It is the most repetitive. It's very much dragged out. Um, and it, it, to me, it's the hardest one to watch. And it is renowned for that. And it, like I say, it's one of those films that you kind of need to see because it's unique in that sense. Because no one ever went there to that extent. And it's horrific. But like I say, I do feel like I'm kind of learning something watching it because you just realize like that these things do actually happen and how lucky we are to not experience that and to be you know have a comfortable lifestyle and things like that it does very much make you um be grateful for what you do have yeah so i guess my my question is um do you think that if from what I've said earlier, the director's intentions are genuine. Do you think that he simply went too far? Or do you think that, you know, what he's done should be commended? Or is he a bastard for doing this? Or, I mean, how do you feel about it? I don't think he should be commended. I think it stands out. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing this. I feel that the reasons for doing this and the intent is purely for shock value, if you ask me. I could be wrong. Um, it could just be that he saw an opportunity to make something that, that hadn't been pushed that far before, but I feel that in doing so, it's all about the shock value and he wanted his film to stand out, to be remembered, and he definitely has done that, but he's gone to this place, <laughs> um, this style of film, in order to achieve that. So I believe that that was his goal. I don't think there's anything wrong in doing that, because we're, because pushing boundaries is what horror is about, and in watching horror, we want to be horrified. We want to see what are the worst possible outcomes. I mean, this is worse than out and out brutal gore, in my opinion, because it is such a sensitive topic and so invasive and so degrading for a human being that it's one of those situations where you feel like a person who goes through that may not want to live after that because it's so horrific. And that, in horror, trumps really brutal gore and death and killing and and violence in, in another kind of sense because a person who's been put through that may not want to continue living after that. That's the reality of this. So he's he's drawn upon the very worst human behaviour imaginable and he's pushed boundaries more than anybody has done and he succeeded in what he's done because this film is still very very well known um, I wouldn't say it was a good thing I wouldn't say it was a bad thing because I think it was necessary 
someone was going to do it and it's now it's part of film history which is what it should be there for so your kind of stance on it is similar to sort of uh, what people say about a serbian film or something like Salo, in that the director's intention is well let's take a serbian film because that's more modern in that the director said oh, is i really don't believe that the serbian film should have been made actually <laughs> Well, There's nothing nothing beneficial in that, but I see how they've pushed boundaries there. And that, again, someone was going to do it, but I think that I Spit on Your Grave has much more value to how we observe it than a Serbian film. Yeah, because what I was going to say was is that the director said that, well, a Serbian film is an allegory for like modern Serbia. So the newborn porn section is about how when you're born, you're basically fucked from birth, basically. So that's all an allegory. But then you watch the film and you go like, well, that's clearly nonsense. <laughs> so it's mm. like, well, so I, I I, mean, to be honest, it's difficult for me to comment on this, you know, anywhere near as strongly as you have and for which I commend you. But I would say, OK, I can see kind of where the director is coming from in that, yes, obviously rape is a horrible thing and hence why it has been presented in such a horrible way. The only thing I would say is that I I kind of on the side of he went probably a little bit too far in that mm. if uh, Jennifer Hills, the main character in the film, if she had been raped maybe once or let's say twice at a push, then yes, fair enough. I can probably see, okay, it probably wouldn't be treated as you know with the it wouldn't have the reputation that it has i think it's because it's so protracted and mm. some of the stuff that happens is horrible i mean yes as i said there's the first rape which fair enough she's held down and she's raped by the main guy johnny i believe his name is um so he's the leader of the group and then as i mentioned there the second rape is an anal rape from what i understand which is absolutely horrible and yeah it's just that was so difficult for me to watch and then you've got the third scene which is where Matthew kind of reluctantly but then he kind of does anyway rape her and then you've got the fourth guy who's the older guy his name's Stanley who I guess he can't get it up so what he does is you know he does something very very inappropriate with a bottle um let's put it that way and yeah and then they tear up her manuscript and yeah they completely debase her and you know at one point well they were supposed to kill her but they tried to get matthew to do it and matthew fucked up because he's simple Hmm. so yeah and all that it takes about 30 minutes for all this to happen and after it you just shell-shocked it's just awful, really. It's, it's pretty exhausting to watch. Yeah. You almost find yourself blocking parts of it out because it becomes so like repetitive and you're trying to understand what's going on and it's not always obvious like you say to it, but you kind of don't want to figure it out as well at the same time because you don't really want to know the ins and outs of it, but but then you kind of need to for the plot and like for discussion like we are now. Um, I agree with you. I think he has gone too far. He's shown too much. But it's like I say, I feel it's entirely for shock value. He's going where other filmmakers haven't gone before. He's showing more than they've shown. It's not really necessary. I agree with you. Um, But it is the premise of the film. And I believe he always set out to do that. And it was entirely for getting this film on the map. Um, So... (laughs) I, moving away from that section now, um, I suppose what I should ask really is um, Jennifer Hills. So she's played by Camille Keaton, who she's in a film that I really like called What Have They Done to Solange, which is Jallo. And, you know, she plays Solange in that, actually. And um, <laughs> very interestingly, her and the director actually were married for three years after this film was made. So they obviously got on quite well while they were making it. <laughs> her performance, what did you think of that? Um, yeah, I thought she was fantastic, actually. I think she did some extremely difficult things in this film. I thought she played the part very well. Uh, she's a very beautiful actress. It's very convincing. She was very convincing in everything she's doing. I liked her as a character. Um, 
and even the the second part of the film where she takes the revenge is all quite convincing although obviously I've told you my stance on that that I didn't approve of some of the things she did but it's still impressive and, and empowering and you know fantastic that she gets she gets her own back so yeah I thought I thought she was amazing in this actually very difficult part to play Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a very brave performance. That's kind of industry term, I think, when someone does a, a role where you know they're naked a lot and they have to do all these. Their character, anyway, goes through all these horrible things. So yeah, it's a very brave performance, absolutely. Although, honestly, sort of the other characters in the film, the acting is not all that great. I'm not gonna lie. Um, it's you can tell obviously they're probably quite amateur actors because none of them I think even did anything after I spit on your grave so the actor who plays Matthew for example um, some of his dialogue wasn't that well performed I'm not gonna lie I thought that was maybe part of his character but maybe I was wrong (laughs) yeah um the main rapist guy so Johnny I think he's all right but the other two guys they don't really do an awful lot um, it's really just Matthew and Johnny who kind of get all the speaking roles. And Matthew, uh, I, mean, I suppose he's all right. But I mean, yeah, um, maybe it is because of his character that he's playing. Um, because he is the first to die. And his death is the second most infamous in the film. Because, uh, I mean, we're going to talk about this with the remake because I have issues with the remake. I have quite strong issues with the remake. See, I. I- didn't mind the remake i quite enjoyed it so well then we're gonna have a fun discussion about that in a minute but anyway um yeah true to form yeah um did you find his death funny yeah i found it really funny and terrible to be honest it wasn't (laughs) executed that well so we have four deaths in this film on my body count and matthew is the first one and yes i did find it very funny it was very weird and how could he not see that coming i mean come on how did she get away with that it's not realistic no it's kind of not because at the end of the day let's think about this so let's pretend (laughs) let's pretend we're in wrestling and let's say let's pretend this is real um so you've just gang raped a woman left her for dead she's not dead she's probably not very happy that she's been raped let's do it <laughs> i would imagine so i'm not gonna lie um she comes and she's like being all seductive towards you now first of all you know if you've done this why wouldn't you just leave straight away like lie low for a few days let let the heat die down as they say but if you're in this situation, why would you then go, oh, well, yeah, all right, I'll have sex with you. But like consensually this time. Yeah, absolutely. That's, you know, by a river. That's not suspicious. Well, to be honest, that part didn't um, annoy me as much as the way that he died, because I thought previously he did want to have sex with her and he, as he, it was mentioned in the film, that he hadn't climax so he, because everybody was watching and he didn't feel like he could and he was just saying like um it was like he, he wasn't happy about it he wanted her on her own like to himself because he'd seen her at the beginning when he delivered delivered her shopping earlier and she had no bra on and he said that he'd seen her boobs through a top and he was like really excited by the prospect so going around there delivering her food again to the house And then he was kind of overwhelmed with guilt because he saw that she was there, but he knew she was still alive because he was the one that hadn't killed her. Um, I think he obviously wanted to see her again. He was obviously attracted to her. And because in the film, he's a simple kind of character. He's mentally challenged. Um, I don't think he can really differentiate between his, his urges to have sex with her. So when she offers it out there, he just can't say no he i just don't think he can he can separate that so that to me made sense that he was she just was gonna lure him out there but the way that she like had this set up rigged so she had this noose ready was just very bizarre and the fact again this is what annoys me is that she was actually going through with having sex with him which she didn't need to do she could have just bumped him off before that happened um then mid midway through having sex whilst he's lay on top of her she puts a noose around his neck hoists it up on a tree and hangs him but 
it took her a good few seconds to put the noose on and tighten it up, so he definitely would have known what was happening and realised, yet he seems totally oblivious to it. So, and I know, like we said, he's a simple, simple guy, but uh, he would have definitely noticed and he would have like tried to stop her put, putting the noose on his neck, in my opinion. Yeah, and I'm not sure that she'd be strong enough to pull him up to the point where he'd be hanging like that. But, yeah. You know, that's the least of the worries in that. Agreed, but the second death annoyed me way more. <laughs> well, okay, so on that note, uh, we move on to the second death, as you said. So uh, we learn a little bit more about Johnny. So we learn that he has a wife and he has kids um, because he's sort of the, uh, the only one who's got like a proper job. So he works as a gas station attendant. Uh, obviously Matthew as you said he works as a delivery man for the grocery store whereas the other two guys are just bums and they just sort of you know don't have jobs and they just kind of hang around the gas station and yes she says as um, you said she comments on the fact that he's married with kids because she's done her research because she wanted to find out where he lives so she could get her own back and he said he says to her a man's just a man married or not when she comments on that, which I found really infuriating. And then he comments on how she was dressed and the bikini and all that kind of crap, which I've, which as I've told you, I don't appreciate at all. So it's like choices in clothing do not make it acceptable for, um, men to, uh, say that, that rape is okay. And this is the big discussion, like, you know, has been going on for years. Um, it's never okay no matter what somebody's wearing and she thought she was in privacy when she was in her bikini she didn't know that they were looking at her so how dare he say that Um, but anyway it's quite satisfying that she like sort of um, goes to the gas station she convinces him um, to get in the car or whatever and then she, she drives him somewhere I think and she pulls out a gun tells him to strip naked which I did find quite satisfying I think yeah you know he needs to be humiliated too and he's kind of confused he's like um, you don't need to have the gun I'll I'll have sex with you you know whether you force me to or not um she just can't believe that he's married with kids and that he's getting away with stuff like this and it is outrageous but this just all takes a very bizarre twist. Like, she goes from being in control and, like, stripping him naked and she could have just shot him then and there. But instead, somehow he talks around and then she feels bad and she says, right, okay then, do you want to go to mine for a hot bath? I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, this really annoyed me. So they go and have this bath and they're all, like, chatting like old mates or something then she gets in the bath and it, he's kind of like wanting to get intimate with her so basically it gets to the point where she has to masturbate him and i'm just like this is what i mean about she doesn't need to go this far with it does it really have to come down to this she's completely naked she's in a comfortable home environment with this man who she's gonna kill like it's just not believable and it's dangerous and stupid she has to like masturbate him in the bath to gain his trust to then kill him which it just doesn't make much sense and then she sneaks the knife into the bath which is you know it's it's very dramatic and effective and she cuts off his penis and he bleeds out in the in the bath and it is memorable i mean there is a lot of blood he's very convincing his screaming um and and his acting is um very convincing she locks the door she lets him like run around in there and bleed out and she goes and puts some classical music on puts her feet up in front of the tv in the living room and she just lets him get on with it which is pretty cool but it's like i say i just don't agree with the fact that she had to go that far sexually with things in order to take her revenge she could have just done that before it got that it got that far Okay, that's a lot to take in. As you can tell, I've got quite strong opinions on this one. <sighs> yeah, yes, you do. Um, not that I blame you, really. Um, so he's only a character in the film. Obviously, in real life, I totally agree that, like, you know, what a woman wears shouldn't give a man the right to have his way with her. Um, however, obviously, he is only a character in a film, so you are not supposed to like him. 
So I think, yes, it's fine. You had the right reaction to what he said, but okay. That being said, I do like this death because one, it's very memorable. And two, I like the delayed reaction to everything that's going on. So it's not like she cuts his dick off and immediately he starts screaming. He kind of, because he, you know, he's getting a hand job in the bath. We've all been there. And basically... <laughs> uh, not me. <laughs> well, um, I'm not a man. <laughs> it's good to know. Um, for all your fans out there. Um, so basically, once it, it's been lopped off, shall we say, he doesn't notice right away. He's kind of like, oh, that's kind of weird. What's going on here? And it's like, that, he, that's he kind of confu- confuses it with pleasure, doesn't he? And he's like, hmm, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then he suddenly realizes what's going on. And then it, there's sort of this very delayed, hor- horrified reactions. Is like, oh my God. And then, yeah, he just starts screaming. Yeah, you said it's very, very realistic. Um, it's actually a very, very good reaction, I think. it's That's what makes it so memorable, is his reaction as well. And yeah, she does have the very cold demeanour to sort of like just do it and then just casually sort of walk off and just let him bleed out, you know, locked in the bathroom. So Yeah, yeah I mean, that aspect of it is pretty cool. And, it, and as she was sat in the bath and um, talking to him, with by the way, I noticed that her hair was way too fancy. Like, she, wasn't she supposed to have like thrown it up so she could get into the bath, like so it was off her shoulders? And suddenly it's like this extravagant, um, well styled hairstyle that looks like she's going to a, a a ball or something. I don't know. I noticed that anyway. I was just like, that's weird. Um, <laughs> so she's in the bath and she's talking to him she's telling him about Matthew and she's telling him yeah you know I killed Matthew that's why he's missing and he's like no you didn't and she's like <laughs> yeah she's like yeah I did I hung him I killed him and, you know that's it and I thought that was pretty cool and he's like ah oh. he's like I don't believe you and then she just chops his dick off just like that and just just walks off and, and you know that is pretty cool but don't agree with the masturbation beforehand sorry (laughs) yeah i i do like there's a consistency in a lot of these rape revenge films where all the people in them are so dumb and like they just do the most stupid things imaginable so yeah you're right so she's telling him oh i killed matthew that's why you can't find him and instead of being like okay that's kind of weird i'm gonna leave now she's just like he's just like yeah sure love whatever and then just kind of carries on just doesn't take her seriously whatsoever which is quite interesting because in the uh, initial scene that you referred to where she made him strip he did have the line i don't like women giving me orders so he obviously doesn't respect women at all so yeah he doesn't and she says it quite nonchalantly and um why would he believe her i mean she's perfect for the park she even her like build and the way she looks and her demeanour is, um, you would just assume she wouldn't be capable of that. She's very innocent seeming, so. Yeah, and then we've got the last two deaths, which happen right at the end of the film, I'm not going to lie. So we've got Andy and Stanley, who get killed in basically the same way. They get killed by a speedboat re- propeller. She runs them over with a speedboat. Amazing. I thought this was particularly great. And after she does the second one in, she then sort of says this. It's a little bit cheesy, but I still liked it anyway. She sort of rides off into the sunset and says, suck it, bitch. (laughs) Which I thought was awesome. So Cool. So, yes, it's it's a pretty harrowing film. Not going to lie, I can't say I had a good time watching it because I don't suppose that's really the point. Although, obviously, you do get the uh, the satisfaction of the revenge aspect and it is really very satisfying in this one. It's far too much sexual violence in this to enjoy it. It's a, it's a little too much, but on the whole, it is a good film. Yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. So it is quite a good film. I mean, as I mentioned, the acting... I mean, Camille Keaton is quite good. Uh, the guy who plays Johnny is pretty good for you know his character what he is the rest of the people in the film are okay not amazing yeah the poster for this film is notorious and iconic as she's um walking into the undergrowth for the bushes and it's got that famous bum shot where her clothes are kind of tight i don't even think it's um camille keaton on no, the poster, it's not. this is somebody else and she's clutching a knife and it's not completely accurate to 
the film at all. It's just a poster image. Uh, it doesn't match the visuals of the film, but it is iconic and did, you know, market the film very well. So, yeah. Um. So yeah. So I thought overall, say the film was pretty good. It's not the best film that we've discussed on this this show and the last show but i mean it's not horrible it's not something i particularly want to watch again i've watched it three times now (laughs) um i really don't want to watch it again um so i'm probably a bit of a stupid question to ask in that is it a video nasty um yes i'm guessing yeah okay yeah this is a pretty easy one um now i mean i say taking the director's intent you know not to repeat what i've said earlier but essentially if the director's intent was to show that rape is really horrible he succeeded um could he have done it slightly differently yes yeah he could have done it very differently um he could have made the rape scenes less protracted um i mean there's scenes kind of with the guys sort of before the rape and scenes with the guys after the rape we could have maybe fleshed them out a little bit more um which i mean if you do want to kind of just very quickly before we get on to the remake um the film is available in the uk it's a avail- it's uh, been released by a company called 101 films um however the film is very heavily cut as you can imagine it's cut by about three minutes so if you want to watch the uncut version which despite how horrible it is if you're going to watch this you should really watch it in its purest form shall we say um yeah you should probably uh seek alternative means to do so um which uh brings us to the subject of the remake and as we mentioned earlier this could get quite interesting so um similarly to last house on the left this was remade in 2009 um so this uh, remake is directed by stephen r monroe who i've never heard of um, has made no films of any note before or after this and to be brutally honest i don't like this film so i'm gonna leave this one with you why don't you like it? Tell, tell us first of all. Okay, so first of all, I don't like the way it looks. So it's got that kind of grey sort of brown look that a lot of modern horror films had around this period that people actually seem to have moved away from now, which is good. So aesthetically, I don't like the way it looks. Now, the rape scene is obviously it's a lot less protracted and it's a lot less nasty. So fair enough, you know that will give it points for that one they introduce a fifth character so instead of it being just four yokels there is a police officer who is kind of corrupt i guess and kind of in charge of these guys and he kind of is first of all introduced as well he might be there to actually help this girl but no quite predictably he is there to actually you know take part and like cover for these four guys who are I mean, admittedly, they're not supposed to be likable, but they're really, really unlikable. I'm sorry. And one of them's got a video camera and he's just retarded. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, yeah. he's completely retarded. So yeah. I didn't like that. Um, but, I mean, all right, fair enough. You know, I get that obviously it's like a rape revenge film. And it's got to have that. But the thing I really, really don't like about this, and I can tell you're probably not going to agree with this, but let me get it all out there, is that in the original she's just you know a girl she's an author so yeah she kills these guys and yeah the deaths might be a little bit silly but they are at least realistic because she's in a situation where you know she wants to get revenge on these guys and she has to use whatever means she has at her disposal even if you know they do look a bit silly in the remake she may as well be fucking jigsaw because (laughs) she, she puts together these really elaborate traps to like you know trap these fucking guys and it's so stupid i'm sorry it's fucking ridiculous see i i agree with everything that you've said but i really enjoyed that part of the film like i loved it i agree i actually do agree with everything that you've said even like the colors of the film and the style that was around in that era which i didn't mind but i totally get it that it was kind of overdone um i was about to say that (laughs) <laughs> I enjoyed the fact that the rapes weren't as protracted. I thought that that was very well done. Um, it's a shame they didn't stick to the storyline as much as the first one and they moved away from it so much. But it was great that she didn't um, pleasure them before she killed them. I very much approve of that. And I was just about to say that there were so many awesome deaths in this that I really enjoyed, like 
her being able to sort of put them through but it did remind me of Saw and that's why I liked it. I think there was like an acid bath at one point and there's another thing where she chopped off a penis and it was very shocking. Um, I'm struggling to remember exact specifics. I remember how I felt after watching the film and during watching it, but the deaths were awesome. I just, I can't remember as many details as I wish I did because it's been a long time since I've watched it. So I would prefer to be on the side of thinking that I can believe that she set it up so well and that she was that smart in order for us to be able to view some amazing revenge deaths. But I agree with you that it is a little elaborate and she'd have to have balls of fucking steel to be able to do that kind of shit. It's like so well planned out and not that realistic, but still very cool to watch. Yeah, I mean, if you like Saw, then great. You know, you'll probably have a great time watching this, absolutely. But I'm sorry, it's like so stupid and totally unrealistic, as I said, because the traps would take like days and days and days of planning. And they're just, they're so elaborate. Like <laughs> She obviously really wants that revenge. She's she's clearly. thought about this a lot while she's been recovering. <laughs> I don't know. I say, I mean, the film's not completely without merit, as I said. I mean, it is, it's all right, really. But, I mean. I thought it was a good remake. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the second half as well. I thought it was very empowering and very cool. Liked seeing her get her own back. Yeah satisfying okay i mean we'll we'll agree to disagree because i mean from the sense of things you you liked it a lot more than i did which is fair enough but as i said like i really was not a fan um however the remake has spawned two sequels which are worse from what i've been told so no, i didn't watch you know. those because i suspected they were going to be bad so i'm kind yeah. of disappointed that they made sequels because there were never sequels to the original one so why would you make sequels to the remake you know uh, because people are lazy and people think it will make money. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, I just never think you should take a remake that far that you need to make two more, but whatever. I didn't watch them purposely because I knew they would be bad. Yeah, the third one, from what I understand, is particularly bad. So, yeah, just uh, steer clear of the sequels to the remake. Let's put it that way. All I saw was a lot of uh, promotional posters with the same sort of similar bum angle on it i'm just like oh god here we go again <laughs> yeah and to be quite frank i mean not to dwell on this for too long but just as a final point similarly to the last house on the left remake it just doesn't need to exist i get that the original has notoriety but really why even make it in the first place the original film is no fun which is not supposed to be but you know torture porn fuck torture porn you know whatever it's just it's just uh i don't know uh, words fail me let's put it that way there was an opportunity because they showed too much in the first one and she it was over sexualized so they saw the opportunity and they remade it <sighs> yeah predictable okay so that is ice bit on your grave so we're going to move on to our next film which is fight for your life now this has the alternative titles of again i hate your guts very popular alternative title bloodbath at 1313 fury drive which is too long held hostage that's two on the nose staying alive which would be hilarious i really wish it was called that just because <laughs> of the other film called that and yeah <laughs> Finally, Getting Even, which again is far, far too on the nose, but hey. Um, and this is directed by Robert A. Endelson. Um, so Ria, tell us the lovely synopsis for Fight for Your Life. Lovely stuff. Okay, yeah. It's a 1977 film. I kind of wish it was called Staying Alive as well, just because of the contrast between these two films. And um, the synopsis is... Um, this is a mean, trashy exploitation picture about three convicts who escape from jail and hole up at the house of a black minister. Um, there are several nasty scenes where the minister's family are repeatedly terrorised by these thugs. In the end, the minister turns tables on the three convicts and gives them their just desserts. Yes, yeah, so this is... Uh... 
very, very slightly different from the other films that we talked about. Although it does have rape in it, rape is not the kind of centre point of the film. Much like Get Out, it's a racism film. Well, yes, although it is very, very different from Get Out. And I should say, for the record, that obviously... When we're talking about this film, obviously one of the characters is very, very racist. I'm not going to lie. And obviously we don't support any kind of you know racism whatsoever. However, obviously we have to discuss certain racist aspects of the film in order to review it properly. So I'm just putting it all out there in case this comes back to me later. So, you know, in case there are any really, really sensitive people out there. But hey, you know what you get yourself into with these video nasty shows. Yeah. So... Excellent disclaimer. (laughs) Yes, thank you very much. So, I quite like the way that this film starts because this film, I don't know if it is technically this, but you could say that this film is a black exploitation film. And the kind of first five minutes sort of very, very much reminds me of a black exploitation film because you've got the very funky song right at the start, which is awesome. Very 70s disco. Yes, exactly. And it, uh, When I started watching this film, I, I in, instantly thought of like Starsky and Hutch meets Shaft meets horror exploitation. Yeah, exactly. And you also have like that staple of uh, black exploitation films. We have the uh, 70s black pimp, which uh, <laughs> I thought was a nice touch. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, and uh, I actually quite liked the characters of the the guys doing the terrorising. I thought they were quite interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, your synopsis is quite interesting because if you take the film kind of at face value and just, let's see, what's it about? It's about these three criminals, one of whom who's white, and they say this says really, really horrible racist things to, like, this black family and essentially it's that for an hour and then they turn the tables on them and you know the gang gets what's coming to them and you can think well why would i want to watch this this just sounds horrible and exploitative Mm -hmm. but it is actually a lot more interesting than that this film is a lot more character driven than maybe you know it would appear you know on the surface would you not agree yeah i do yeah i do think the characters are very very interesting and i Obviously, they are, again, pushing boundaries by using a lot of racist words that go through me. It's like, I would never even consider using these words, and a lot of people would not. It's very much frowned upon. Uh, um, Dare I say it, the C word, coon, is used in this film, which is like a sort of running South Park joke now, I think, Um, because it's so controversial. South Park get away with it in a comedy sort of manner, but in this context, it's awful. (laughs) Yeah, it's very uncomfortable to watch. Yes. Now, now, what's interesting is that the gang, now you'd think it'd be three white guys, but it's actually not. So the, the leader of the gang, whose name is really awesome, it's Jesse Lee Kane, and he is played by William Sanderson, who is the most well-known actor in this film. Um, he is most well-known because he actually appeared in Blade Runner, which, if you watch this, is absolutely amazing that he went from this to a few years later playing in Blade Runner. Um, I think he's incredibly good in this film, though. Oh, yeah, but... he's very good. Um, yeah. Although he's also in True Blood, apparently, although I don't watch TV, so, you know. But, hey, apparently he's in that. But also, um, so he's white, obviously, but his two kind of... Well, the two other criminals that have escaped prison with him, one of which is Hispanic and the other is sort of Oriental. In in the film, he's called Oriental. or I think he's actually supposed to be Chinese, but I could be wrong. Agreed. Uh, Yeah, I think I think he looks Chinese, but it's not mentioned, is it? Yeah, well, his name's Ling, and I mean, I I speak a little bit of Japanese, and there's no L in Japanese language, so I assume he must be Chinese. So, you know. Hmm. (laughs) Um, So, and it's quite interesting because the dynamic of the gang, so once again, what you have is you have Kane, who is the leader, but he's really a big coward because basically what happens a lot of the time is he threatens people But he only really kills people because he has to in self-defense. If you notice in the film, whenever anyone is sort of pointing a gun at him, he will shoot them. But he threatens his family a lot, but he Mm. doesn't really do anything to them if you actually watch the film from beginning to end. I mean, other than the rape. But other than that, 
and maybe there's some little bit of violence but obviously he never kills any of the family the family all survive believe it or not yeah and uh, like i say he's just getting out all the big contra- controversial insults and the the like i mentioned about that one uncomfortable word but then he starts calling them spades and he does a lot of um shoe shine um slavery kind of talk and stuff like that and it really does go through you he's really sort of going for it. it's so insulting and he's in their home as well it's just like uh he get he gets the father of the family to get up and do a little tap dance and yeah. orders him you know around like a dancing monkey he's just kind of like making him do whatever he says and it's very um degrading and very uncomfortable to watch yeah so you're right and there's also um i think he asked him to shine his shoes at one point but yeah the the bit where he does make him dance and sing although the singing does become like a a bit of a a protest that the dad uses as a way of kind of rebelling against Cain. yeah the dancing bit is like really really uncomfortable because he's been so horrible (laughs) <laughs> so so horrible and yeah it's it's more about dignity they're sort of raping the family especially the father because the father whose name's ted his name's ted turner which i think is quite funny <laughs> he is a pastor at the local church and i think what this film is trying to do is it's showing that in the civil rights movement you had people like the black panthers and malcolm x and people like that who were on one side and then you had kind of people like martin luther king who are on the other side who are like sort of non-violent protest and things like that so the family well the dad mainly is more on the side of turning the other cheek and sort of forgiving people and sort of you know because of his religious views maybe because of who he is he won't fight back until he's obviously pushed to the point where he just goes well fuck this <laughs> it's like it just completely completely goes well, fuck you and then yeah they all start fighting back yeah and doesn't the main guy explain this away later by saying something about his mum ran off with a black man or something yeah so i mean that's jumping right to the end of the film but yes he does kind of explain all this away because his mum ran off with a black man and to be honest he was in prison he was probably raped by black people in prison so that is insinuated as well yeah Um, and there's also a very ironic part where he hits the dad with the pastor with the bible yeah and it's shot in a very interesting way because what they do is they slow the footage down so it's got this very kind of odd quality to it while it's going on and yeah it's a uh, yeah it's very weird so it's, yeah, say hitting him across the face over and over and over again with a bible it's a very visual metaphor and um the rape scene like you say isn't as um drawn out and frequent as the previous films that we have discussed um uh, especially um the one that we've just discussed in this episode um but it's very dis- distressing because um it's very derogatory it's very racist and the police are actually listening in on the radio or trying to so whilst that's going on everybody's kind of listening to it which is just a bit weird as well nobody's doing anything yeah exactly um so the rape scene as you said it's on paper it sounds very similar to you know the one in i spit on your grave where it's three guys one after the other multiple rapes but you don't see anything so we know it's happened but you know because we can't see anything it's fine you know it's less upsetting yeah it's it's much less upsetting but it is still very derogatory it's more about the humiliation and derogatory nature of the racism yeah so Kane, as i said earlier he um he's a bit of a coward and i think he likes having power but he won't do anything to get it and people don't respect him now interestingly though he is obviously a sadist he's not the most sadistic person of the free the uh, the worst criminal in my opinion and the one who actually seems to kill people and enjoy it is ling the uh, chinese guy who kills two people agree so and then you've got chino who is I suppose Mexican, although this isn't really confirmed, who seems to be only along for the ride, who just wants to, you know, I think they're going to Canada or they're going to Mexico. Anyway, they're trying to cross a border. And I think he's just there just to, you know, 
join in he's not really there to kind of take part in everything that's going on but yeah so it's quite interesting you've got these different dynamics with all the characters and it's the same with the family as well yeah and like i say the body count is not high in this film the family do actually get away which is satisfying there are only two deaths in this film and um uh the friend of the little boy is one of them unfortunately which is terrible but obviously it's quite satisfying that our worst criminal um the the main guy that you've just described is called Kane well yeah so there's Kane and there's Ling and there's Chino yeah so Kane gets shot eventually um but it, it the, the characters in this film are what make it and it is very interesting and obviously very controversial with a lot of the wording used, which I haven't heard in films, maybe ever, I was going to say, in, in a long while, but probably never heard that much racist derogatory language in a film ever. Well, yeah, even in something like American History X, like, it's not really used. You might hear the N-word a couple of times, but that's about it, really. Yes, it really goes for it in this film and it's, it is very shocking and like you say, he is a coward so that's his power is just doing that and he seems to get away with it. I think that's what makes him so interesting that there's a lot more depth to his character and you're just waiting to see how far he will go but actually he's not He's not as sadistic as, as Ling, as you say. Yeah, so I mean... <laughs> What I would say, and I'm quite curious as to your thoughts on this, because you were quite passionate about the previous film that we spoke about. Now, I don't believe that the film itself is racist, even though it has a very racist character. Would you agree? Um, no, it's not. It's um very diverse, actually. And it's not really pro any particular race. It's still neutral. He's racist, the film isn't racist. Yeah, so it's quite interesting because, I mean, to me, I don't know, it kind of depends if you're a black or a white person watching this. If you're a black person watching this, then I think even though you've got a character that's being very, very nasty throughout you know, most of the film and saying really very racist things against people of your race, I think by the end... You would probably sort of be, you know, you'd want the family to do well. And the family are quite likeable, um, which is quite interesting. Um, my favourite character in the family, and I I'm, I'm, don't know if it's yours as well, I'm going to ask you in a sec, uh, was the grandmother. The grandmother is awesome in this film. Yeah, she was my favourite too. I really liked her. Sassy black grandma. Yeah, she was amazing. I liked her. She she was very memorable. I quite like the kid as well. And um, the dad was, was cool as well. Yeah, so you've got the son whose name's Floyd with his Muhammad Ali uh, obsession because he's got a t-shirt with Muhammad Ali on it and he keeps quoting like Muhammad Ali, I guess in a way that a child probably would do really mm. back then because um, he would be obviously a very prominent black role model back then. Um, so as you mentioned, the body count is not particularly high. Um, so we have two main deaths, as you said. So the first one of these is a white woman who is the girlfriend of the family's dead son because the son died in Vietnam. Um, oh, so does that make three deaths then? Well, okay, so it's interesting. So you've got all the people who get shot at the start of the film when the gang are getting away. You've got the person at the um, liquor store. He gets shot. <laughs> and then Kane points a gun at a baby, <laughs> which is quite funny. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Um, I don't think that was supposed to be funny, but as I mentioned on the last show, I have a pretty, pretty sick sense of humour. So, <laughs> yeah, so there's that. Um, the, criminal, the, the three kind of escaped convicts, they all die. So... Ling dies, he gets a pane of glass put through his midsection when he's trying to escape the house, so I assume he dies. Chino dies, because I think he either gets stabbed or shot um, in the house, so he dies, and obviously Kane gets shot right at the end. Yeah, so I stand corrected, but the, the, the kid's friend dies as well. Yes, and that one was quite upsetting, I'm not going to lie. That was probably the most upsetting. Um, so the white so woman... So I thought that none of the other deaths were shown, so I'd only written down two, but... That sounds like I mean, it's a much longer list. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, you're not necessarily wrong. I mean, that's your interpretation of what happened in the film. But, I mean, my interpretation was there were quite a few. Um, so, mm. 
yeah, so let's talk about the two deaths that you have listed. So we've got Karen, who, as we said, is the girlfriend of the uh, dead son. And I'm not going to lie, her, one of the only things I would say kind of negatively about the film is I'm not sure kind of what her character kind of brought to the film other than to get naked <laughs> and appear in a really cheesy flashback scene. Really? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's it, really. And she dies in a really shit way, also, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so, okay, so that makes three. So let's up the count. Yeah, so, I mean, basically, does she? I think, so she's being chased by Ling, and mm-hmm. she is kind of, I assume she was going to get raped. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so this was kind of just after I'd seen sort of I Spit on Your Grave, and I'm like, oh, God, I really don't want to watch any more of this. Um, <laughs> Another half hour of rape scenes. <laughs> yeah. But although she is naked, she then falls down the side of a waterfall. At least that's kind of what it looked. I'm not quite sure how she would not see that. I don't think she deliberately jumped to her death. I think it was more of an accident. So, whoops. Okay. So death by waterfall. Um, so I don't know what would you total up the deaths to be then from that list. So, um, well, so that's three plus. As I said, you got the three criminals. You got the kid, whose name is Dun Dun Dun. Where are you, child? Joey. Mm-hmm. Um, so he gets beaten to death by Ling with a rock, mm-hmm. which is very brutal. <laughs> so again, it's sort of an exploitation film. So you will have a small boy being beaten to death by a rock. Um, yeah, which is pretty Very unpleasant. Upsetting. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that's four plus the girlfriend, which is five. Yep, and we got the guy at the uh, liquor store at the start of the film. So this is Six. when they take the daughter hostage. So they shoot him, although it's his own fault because you know he goes grabbing for a gun, and then you know, like I said, Kane, he only shoots people you know when he's kind of self defense. So, yeah, that's kind of self-defense. So, yeah, so that's six. Six, yeah. And then there may be possibly more at the start. I'm not going to lie, you know, because they escape. So they may have killed people when they escaped, but none of them stand out. So let's just say six for for the sake of argument. Okay. So six deaths. I stand corrected. Yes. Um, Now, the police are fairly heavily involved in this film so we have kind of two policemen so one of whom is the local policeman who is joey's dad and we have a kind of i think he's a police officer for someone like the fbi who's trying to track down the criminals now this policeman has this quirk where he sticks to the letter of the law like really really heavily so they're chasing this guy who they think is the the criminals in his car and it's not them but he still arrests the guy anyway because he was speeding which is <laughs> yeah, pretty ridiculous although um well speaking of police you seem to have got police <laughs> in, where you are where the, where the hell were they today when i was getting uh, sexually harassed at the supermarket <laughs> wow well, i don't know eating donuts if simpsons or anything to go by <laughs> I did like, I think there was quite a badass quote by the grandma that you so liked. I think she calls, um, what's the uh, the main guy called again? Kane. Kane, that's the one. Uh, she calls him a two-legged yellow dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I thought that was quite funny. She's like very sassy. Yeah, oh yeah. I love a good old black sassy grandma in a wheelchair. Which is, uh, yeah. yeah, even funnier. Dishing out, dishing out all the insults. It's oh, quite funny. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so one of the stupid policemen, um, so this guy who's Joey's dad, obviously he finds out that Joey's dead. And what happens is, is that he just runs blindly into the house. And obviously he gets shot because that's what tends to happen in these films. So, yeah. So, yeah, just dumb police all round, I think. I think it would be quite appropriate to like maybe have uh, Beastie Boys fight for your right to party instead of fight for your life. Because <laughs> that's what this title made me think of instantly. Yeah, yeah, it's quite, yeah. I think there are other songs as well that are just called Fight for Your Right as well. So like, you know, it's quite easy to get confused, I guess. So anyway, so overall, 
I would say the film is actually pretty good. So, you know, the characters are quite well written. Um, it's got quite a good pace. Um, it's Fair. not... A bit, bit of humour as well. Yeah, so we've got a sassy black woman in it, which, you know, I quite like. Um, yeah, um, very racist. You know, the one character, of course. However, I mean... I wouldn't heavily recommend it, but it was, it was, a, it was an all right watch. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't boring. And yeah, it did have the cool black exploitation sort of song at the beginning and at the end as well, which I quite appreciated. So that was always cool. Um, now, <laughs> this is, uh, again, probably going to be quite an easy question. Um, fight for your life, video nasty? Yes. Yeah, this one, again, kind of an easy one um, for the obvious reason. Strong language and strong racism and uh, uncomfortable rape. Yeah, and um, it will come as no surprise that this film is not available in the UK. In fact, I don't think it's ever really been available in the UK since the DVD era. Um, so no one has dis- no tried to make money off of it by uh, submitting it for classification. So, yeah. Not at all surprised, to be fair. No, alternative means needed for this one, I believe. Um, So that brings us to our last film for the show, which is a film called Axe. Now, I did refer to this on a previous show because one of the alternative titles for this is the California Axe Massacre. Um, Other names include California Axe Murders, The Axe Murders, The Virgin Slaughter, and its alternative title, which is Lisa Lisa. And it's directed by Frederick R. Friedel, who appears in the film as one of the criminals. Mm. So, That's a, that, Ria, his his name is kind of creepy, don't you think, Frederick R. Friedel? <laughs> Sounds like a fucking serial killer. I'm sure he'll be delighted to know that you think his name makes him sound like a serial killer if he ever listens to the show. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Friedel, I do apologise. Yes. And uh, I, I respect your filmmaking skills and enjoyed the film. <laughs> well, that is a different matter altogether. Um, so, Ria, um, what is the synopsis of Axe? Okay, so Axe, which I think is actually a pretty badass title. I mean, three letters, snappy to the point, and... It's a prominent weapon in the film, so I like that title. It's a 1974 film, and the synopsis is Three criminals on a murder spree arrive at a farmhouse where a girl is living with her paralysed grandfather. Okay, so, <laughs> um, Ria, did you like Axe? Um, I thought it was very creepy, very weird. Um, not amazing, but an alright film. What did you think of it? Well, again, now this is interesting because this is actually technically the shortest video nasty, although it doesn't feel like the shortest video nasty. Um, It is technically, I would think it's an hour and eight minutes, although the uh, opening credits are three minutes long and the end credits are about five minutes long. So really, the film is an hour long, literally. We have done shows longer than this film. In fact, every show we've done has basically been longer than this film. So, (laughs) yeah, not really a lot to say on this one because really... The the plot is so ridiculously simple. There's a gang of criminals. They kill a guy. They go to, like, a gas station in America. They terrorise a woman who works there. They go to the farmhouse. They aren't very nice to, you know, Lisa and her granddad. One of them tries to rape Lisa. She kills him. She kills the other one, who also tries to rape her. And, um... (laughs) <laughs> the last guy tries to run away and he gets shot by the police at the end. Yeah, well, I actually did a bit of reading on the background of this film because um, obviously it is a little wishy-washy and the pacing is very weird, it's very choppy. Um, so I looked into it to find out why that was. So I found out that, um, I believe Frederick R. Friedel uh, only made this one. He had no career after this. And the reason being was that it was a it was a low budget film made um, as part of a local driving film bill, and it had to be of a certain length, and that was so that people could make a trip to the confectionery counter after not too long a time. So they wanted people to visit more frequently in between the short films that they were putting on 
in order to spend more money. Um, so in in America, as I say, um, American Driving film um, back in the seventies, and I believe that there was a lot more to this film, but due to low cost and time restrictions, a lot of it ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, so that's the explanation for this film and the way that it was thrown together. Um, it has been said by this person who left a review on IMDb where I read all of this information that if he felt that because it was done on such a shoestring budget that it's quite inspiring that anybody could really make a film like this, like even college students. I don't know if they were college students at the time when they made it, but um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's, it's not terrible, it's not brilliant, um, and it is very sloppily thrown together, but I think that they had to cut it short because of the um, restrictions that they had. Uh, I, I found this film quite amusing in parts. Like, I found that, that Lisa reminded me of, like, Veruca Salt. <laughs> she right. looks like a... From Willy Wonka. Mm. And that guy's hair was absolutely ridiculous 70s hair. Like that kind of fuzzy bear kind of hair. So I just had that in my head all the way through. And I was just like, couldn't take it that seriously, to be honest. Yeah, that's Frederick R. Friedel. So that's a director. So, um, yeah. Oh, I've insulted him twice now. Yes, you sorry have. Sorry about that. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> he, prob- he probably wants nothing to do with this film if he never went on to make any more. So, who knows? Probably not. Probably not. Um, so there are a couple of slightly interesting touches to this. Um, the whole thing has a kind of dreamlike quality because no one is really very histrionic in this film. It's all very kind of like dialed down. Even when people upset, they don't seem to get upset to the point where they start shouting at people or anything like that. It's all just, you know, no one seems to be that bothered by what's going on. It's very bizarre. Yeah, Um, it's very surreal. And it almost reminded me a bit of like erase her head in a way like not completely that aesthetic but the way that she's repetitively preparing meals for the paralyzed grandfather it kind of had that weird erase her head lynchian dynamic and quite frequently she was giving him like raw eggs or tomato soup and it was just very very strange um dreamlike like you say yeah and there's a scene where like she cuts her head off a chicken and the headless chicken carcass is just you know on the side of like the kitchen sink just bleeding out for ages it's yeah that's that's very a razor head-esque i guess although it's sort of giving the film more credit than it deserves with that comparison i believe although for it's sure yeah kind of interesting i suppose the only other thing that is interesting is the score which is very odd so what you have yeah, is, I didn't like the music. To be really? Fair. Okay. I kind of liked the music because it was just so odd. It's just so different. So you got like the jazzy drums, like you got jazzy cymbals, you got what sounded like, um, yeah, like tom toms, I guess. And then you've got the weird synthy bits, sort of for when, you know, it's just Lisa and her granddad. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know. I couldn't get my head around the raw eggs. Like, I wasn't sure what that represented, but. I did see, I thought the tomato soup was very effective because it's just like red for blood all the time. And then you had the chicken bleeding out in the kitchen, which was also red. I thought that was quite effective. Um, One thing that at first like stood out to me was when she did all the chopping up with the axe and she put the body into the trunk. She's got quite a sweet, innocent sort of girlish yellow dress on. Um, there's not a splash of blood on that which at first annoyed me but then like you say I think it added to this kind of surreal quality where it felt like none of it was really happening Um, but it was creepy at the same time so yeah I I thought it was quite effective in that way there was also this weird bit where um, one of the guys was cutting his toenails in the front room and, and that was quite sort of disgusting and like um sort of i don't know like dirty behavior in the front room it just so out of place but like i say it just creates this weird dynamic like the whole film was so i didn't hate this film i thought it was i thought it was all right actually i thought it was interesting just 
very fast paced and didn't make that much sense. Okay, I thought it was very slow paced personally. I thought that was kind of one of the issues I had with it in that there's a whole 10 minute section where bear in mind this film is only an hour long. Um, not really a lot happened. You just had like the gang driving and Lisa and her granddad kind of just doing stuff at their house. And yeah, mm. it's just it, the pacing was just very slow. Yeah, the, to film, me. the film's over before you know it. So pretty much, yeah. Uh, there's uh, one line. I don't know if you pick up on this because normally you're the one who picks up on the amusing lines. Uh, there's a line right near the beginning of the film. So so um, the body count is five in this and the second guy who dies is he's just some dude who doesn't really appear in the film other than one scene so he uh, commits suicide but jumping out of a window and one of the, the two of the gang have this conversation and one of them says why do you do that it's a 12th floor and the other one goes it's only nine so I'm like oh okay <laughs> that's a bit weird Oh, I didn't pick up on that one, actually. Yeah, so it's just a very bizarre line that makes literally, like, no sense whatsoever, but hey. Yeah, so yeah, I got five deaths. Um, First one is a man in an apartment beaten to death with a hammer. Yes, amongst other things, including a doll, which I thought was quite funny. He seemed to be beaten up with an all manner of implements in his flat. Yeah, and then uh, threatens to cut off a nose. Yes, and yeah, then you've got the guy who uh, jumped out the window, as I said. Oh, yeah. Um, and then there's the first guy that rapes her, and sh- uh, she's a razor blade. Yeah, although I don't know if he really rapes her. It's hard to tell because, again, it's not really a rape revenge film as such, although it's more attempted rape revenge. So, yeah, he kind of tries to, and then, uh, yeah, you, as you said, he she cuts him um, around the back of his neck, which looked very, very kind of, you know, gruesome. Yeah, and um, at one point when they, um, there was some ketchup and beer being poured on her, which was quite, like, derogatory. Yeah, no, I agree. And then she cuts um this guy whose name's Lomax she cuts him up with an axe which is where the name of the film axe comes from um which is kind of misleading because similar to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre where only one person actually gets killed with a chainsaw um I believe I don't know if anyone actually gets killed with an axe in this although I could be wrong let me double check oh yeah no so sorry so only one guy gets killed with an axe in the whole film. So it's actually exactly yeah. the same. She like chops him up and puts him in the trunk. And uh, I think it's worthy of the title because it is impressive. I mean, she's quite a slight girl. She's not like, she's quite a young, small girl, you know. Uh, she chops him up. Yeah. And then um, basically, I mean, the plot, there isn't really much plot in this. Um, the leader of the gang, <laughs> like that song, um, she kills him with an axe he tries to rape her it takes ages there's a huge struggle and there's this weird jingly jangly kind of piano during all this which was a bit annoying i'm not gonna lie and (laughs) yeah then uh yeah he dies and then you've got the scene where she's making sort of what she says is tomato soup although it looked like blood to be honest that was very very odd and then (laughs) yeah the director's character because he's the last one so hmm wonder if uh yeah i'm gonna be the last one to live so yeah i'm gonna write that in the script um so <laughs> yeah um the police arrive he runs out the house like an idiot and he gets shot and killed and then that's it really <laughs> not really much more to say other than that well apparently our reviewer on imdb who was involved in this production said that most of the crew were paid a hundred dollars and that's not like for the day that was for the whole thing i don't know how long they spent filming this but everybody got paid a hundred dollars god knows how much the actors got paid um and uh, yeah i don't think that this film is terrible i thought it was interesting um, very weird a little confusing but not bad kind of creepy <laughs> yeah it's okay i mean we have watched way way worse films than uh, yeah. than this I would rather watch this than, you know, the ghastly ones or Frozen Scream or Hellraiser Revelation, you know, that one. 
same yeah i would rather watch this um it doesn't really stand up to the test of time it's not as good as stuff that we watch these days so it's not really you know you, it's not really a must see but if you are like us and you're a bit of a completist and you want to see more video nasties for like historical kind of horror reasons then it's a decent watch some pretty creepy ideas and it's very surreal and it, i did find it more interesting once i knew it was a a horror driving movie film because they would have showed like probably four films that night so this would have been one of those so now that once i knew that and i imagined an american driving it made it seem that much more kind of had had more charm to it yeah it's probably the same with blood feast actually because blood feast is also really short it's like barely over an hour long so it does kind of like yeah it must have been you know for that same reason i think anyway super cool i love the idea of american driving films i think it's amazing especially horror oh yeah yeah absolutely that that would be a, a great thing to experience unfortunately uh, living in the uk we uh, never got to experience things like that um yeah, yeah. they do have that in manchester actually but i missed out on that so oh there you go is that because you were too young or because you weren't there no, they started doing it um, after I moved to London, and I've been in London almost five years now. So it was kind of more of a novelty thing that they, they brought back. Um, but there are very few places that have the kind of huge driving screen, and there, apparently there was one portable one that was in Manchester that was driven around. So they they had it, they trialled it. I don't know how successful it is. I think they might show, show it regularly. Either that or it, it stopped, I'm not sure. Well, hey, maybe they should bring one to London. So, you know, maybe one already exists and we're just not aware of it. Who knows? Uh, There's probably not enough space in London. However, they do have those rooftop screenings instead, which I think is like the equivalent. Yeah, that's not really the same. No, it's not the same. No, I want to be able to watch films in a car and, you know, possibly get killed by serial killers because that seems to happen a lot at drive-ins from my experience. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway is this a video nasty Mm, yeah there's a lot of implied rape and it is very creepy and she's young and vulnerable so I'm going to say yeah it's not as violent and and aggressive and sexual as the other films but I still think it has that sinister sexual undertone Um, I'm going to disagree with you uh, I'm going to say no, only really because, yeah, I mean, technically, is it really rape? The f- mm, not really. And to me, it's like very, very, very way down on the sleeve scale, you know, compared to what we have discussed. I just, you know, the film's too short. It's far too low budget. And yeah, it's just... I don't know, the film, the way it's made and the way, just the way the film is, you know, just doesn't, I don't it's know. Not, it, it's not as offensive. I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, there's exactly. Not, there's not a lot, there's not a lot to see. The, like, the message is there, but it's not nearly as um, terrible as the ones that we've discussed around this. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, on paper, yeah, it could be absolutely horrendous, but in reality, it really was not. Um, it was very short and inoffensive, so no from me. Um, however, if you do want to watch the film yourself, if uh, our review hasn't totally put you off, it is actually available in the UK on DVD. It's from a company called 4 Digital Media, um, which is very strange that that's available and other films are not but hey you know that's how it goes um so that brings us to the end of the show and to the end of our rape revenge series um which uh has been very tough in places and grim as fuck in other places um so um more video nasties will be forthcoming this year at some point um which i hope you guys are all looking forward to i want to thank you very much for listening um if you're listening it means that you're listening to us on our youtube channel you're listening to us on itunes if you do listen to us on itube please rate us five stars um because it means that more people will kind of see us and listen to us because you know i want to get us out there as much as possible um if you haven't done so already please like our facebook page and uh yeah just thank you very much really appreciate uh the listens 
he's been Greg Knox, now Cat Dad, and I have been Rhea Fend, alternative model and actress, and um, you can find me on Facebook as Rhea Fend, as always, and on Instagram at Rhea underscore Fend, and Twitter the same, the same um, tag name. And thanks everybody for your support and for following us on social media. We'll be back next time for more video nasties and then not so long after that for a Halloween special, which I think you're going to love. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. And uh, yeah, um, anyone who owns a cat or has owned a cat will know exactly what it's like. So uh, yeah, (laughs) if you have heard any kind of strange noises in the episode, it's our cat. Um, So yeah. (laughs) Um, so thank you very much for listening as I said Uh, my name is Greg Knox and uh, we will see you again next time bye everyone